Today we're going to continue. This is the fourth part in our series on the woman at the dumpster, the lady that came so close to Jesus she touched the hem of his garment. And as we put together uh, Hebrews 11, 6, five parts in that verse, which I think she demonstrates each of those. We are going to continue today with the fourth section of Hebrews 11, 6, which says that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so, uh, just to quickly review, and they're on the other messages, so I won't deal at length with them, but if we were to walk by the dumpster outside this lady's house on her way to go touch the hem of Jesus' garment, we talked about without faith, it's impossible to please him. There was a mirror, her mirror, that she had to get rid of her mirror. And, uh, her mask, coming to God with no pre pretense, no, no uh, trying to impress or do anything like that. And last time was the fact that she threw her monitor. Monitors are things that allow us to delay and have distant relationships, conversations across thousands of miles and uh, perhaps a time delay of recorded so you can have it yesterday. But she had to believe that he is, not he was back in the past somewhere, but right that day he was in her hometown. And so today we're going to talk about she needed to toss her mattress. In case you're wondering what that is on the dumpster, that is a mattress. And we uh, are going to see that she co chose courage over comfort as we look at the fourth section of Hebrews 11:6, which says that he is a rewarder. And so God help us to, to choose courage over comfort in our lives, in our relationship. We uh, understand that God is not only a giver of gifts, but he's also a giver of rewards. And there's a huge difference in those. I've shared two messages earlier last year about the difference between true grit and a true gift and the five heavenly crowns, which are not gifts, they are rewards. You don't just walk into heaven and say, I'd like the crown of life, or I would like the whatever crown that are, five of them that are listed there, but uh, they are earned. There is something that is achieved for us to, to gain them. And, and I want us to see that this woman achieved something today. When she went through and touched the hem of his garment, it took some effort, it took some perseverance, it took some grit on her part, just as it takes in our relationship with God to grow close to Him. Now, our entrance into heaven is a gift. We can't earn it. We only believe and receive. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 makes that clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. On the other hand, rewards are based on achievement. Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Not my gift is with me, but my reward is with me. I will give according to not to what you believed and received just by faith, but according to what you have done. And this lady received something because of what she had done and not just what she thought. Uh, not just what she believed, but faith without works is dead. And she, she put some shoe leather to her faith. Uh, she faced a difficult challenge, and she went for it. We read in Mark, Mark 5, 27. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Her healing was not just a gift. She didn't just lean back in her lazy boy recliner and hold her hand out to receive a blessing. She did what she had to do to reach her hand out to touch Jesus in the middle of a multitude of people. Uh, she was rewarded for the effort she made. She left the familiar confines of her house. She may have felt that day like, I don't even want to get out of bed. This mattress is my friend. But she said farewell to her mattress that morning. Uh, she may have paid a lot of money for that mattress. 
Uh, if she lived in our day, she would have had a variety of choices. Have you ever noticed how many mattresses store there are here in town? I looked at some mattresses ads and one that caught my eye was the Puffy Lux mattress. According to customers, it's like sleeping on a cloud. It's ranked the most comfortable mattress by multiple review sites. In addition to comfort, sleepers experience less back pain and feel relief with Puffy's adaptive cloud technology. According to the, the advertisement, Puffy's cloud foam provides pressure relief. It sleeps cool and it conforms to the body. So whatever her mattress was there, I imagine it was her safe and familiar place. A refuge from the cruel, cruel world out there for the last 12 years that she'd been dealing with this issue where she could hide and try to escape the circumstances that faced her every time she went out in public. It probably also had a big security blanket for a bedspread. But that day she got up, she got dressed, she went outside, and in effect she tossed her mattress in the dumpster. She pressed through the crowd and literally touched the clothes that Jesus was wearing. Can you imagine if she had tried to drag a mattress along? I don't think it ever would have happened. And we need to let go of our mattress if we're going to press through and touch the hem of his garment. She said in verse 28, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. If I do something the Holy Spirit is prompting me to do, then God will heal me. The other side of that coin is, if I don't, then he won't. Rewards come as a consequence of our decisions. And regrets come as consequence of our decisions. If she had not stepped out in faith, she would have regretted it for the rest of her life, Wish she could do it over. No sadder words of tongue or pen than these four words, it might have been. We are not a product of chance, but of our choices. And if I'm in close relationship with God, it's a consequence of my actions. I, if I am distant, that it's a consequence also. It wasn't an easy decision for her. Do I really want to risk going out there where people point at me, they stare at me, they whisper for their children to stay away from me because I'm unclean? If they touch me, they will become unclean until evening themselves. And it's going to require that I physically push people out of the way to get close enough to touch Jesus. A lot of risk involved here. Uh, a lot of opportunity for people to to point her out and to run away or to push her away, reject her again. But she decided it's going to be worth it. The risk is worth the reward. It all comes down to this question. Do I really think it's worth what I have to do to get close to Jesus? If I do believe, then I will pursue. If I don't, then I won't. And the specific purpose of this whole Woman at the Dumpster series is to help us learn from her example how to draw closer to Jesus. Today we're looking at the fact that it takes effort, it takes self-discipline and even sacrifice for that to happen. He is a rewarder. He is not a rewarder of them that half-heartedly seek him. He's not a rewarder of them that lazily seek him. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that means there will be times when we need to throw our mattress in the dumpster. There aren't many positive rewards for being lazy. I'm not here to condemn anyone who's medically bedridden. I'm just talking to us who are spiritually bedridden. And I say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Get up. Gather together with the family of God if that's possible for you. If you want to get closer to God, be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters. Hebrews 10 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You want to get close to God, get close to God's people. Be encouraged, be stirred up to love and to good works. Toss your mattress and get out and gather. Keith Green had a song called Asleep in the Light. Uh, among the words there, it said, Oh, Jesus rose from the dead. You can't even get out of bed. Uh, if you can't be a person on site, then exert, 
yourself to tune in with TV or radio or your website browser to a place where the heart of God is proclaimed. Get close to Him in any way that you can. Relationships require cultivation. Crops don't thrive without preparation, continued care. The farmer doesn't just sit in the shade sipping a soda, then reach out and expect the heads of wheat to gently fall magically into his hand. No, he takes that hand and he puts it to the plow. Proverbs 20 verse 4 says, A sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. To go out there and plow, it exposes you to the elements. It's not convenient. It's not comfortable some days. It's, there might be wind. There might be rain. could be heat. could be cold. Some days the ground will seem rock hard. The sun will seem hot. The heat humid. The mosquitoes and flies abundant. The oxen may be uncooperative and the plow dull and invitations on every side to go swimming or fishing or shopping or camping or playing video games or just to come and, and hit the hammock. But that farmer puts his hand to the plow. He steps out of his comfort zone and what he feels like doing. He, after he plows the ground, then he reaches that hand into a bag of wheat kernels and sows seed into the soil. He puts that hand to the hoe and to the scythe and the threshing sledge, and then he gathers all the grain into the barn. The harvest that he experiences is not a free gift that he did nothing to achieve. It's a reward of his labor. Likewise, a close relationship with God requires intentional, conscientious effort. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hosea 10, verse 12 says, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. You know, farming has its seasons. There's planting, there's a season of plowing, of cultivating, and of harvesting. A uh, farmer doesn't see obvious progress every day. It doesn't, uh, the, the seeds don't sprout the first day they're planted and they don't grow two feet tall the second day they're out there. But if you keep working while you wait, sooner or later what happens in Galatians 6, 9 is going to be true. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So in our pursuit of God, uh, being diligent seekers that he rewards. The issue is self-discipline. Ted Roberts in his book, Pure Desire, says this, Nothing of any significance in our world takes place apart from self-discipline. No gold medals at the Olympics. No great teaching in the classroom. No long-term effectiveness in the business world. No great dads or moms. And definitely no great marriages. Nothing of positive, lasting impact is possible without self-discipline. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the issue wasn't merely about revisiting hunger or personal power. It was about whether he would take a shortcut from the Father's plan for humanity's salvation. Jesus was faced with an incredible temptation that can be distilled into one sentence. Jesus, why put up with all this suffering and inconvenience? But the question was settled in the wilderness, and it was one of self-discipline, self-control, which is really spirit control, obedience. Best definition I've heard of self-control, self-control is instant obedience to the initial promptings of God's Holy Spirit. And whether that prompting is to open your Bible, to go to church, to give somebody a call on the phone, to give to some need or whatever it is. Uh, if you want to Grow close to Jesus, obey, and don't do what you feel like doing. Self-discipline. There are no shortcuts to spiritual growth, no magical maturity pills. Amos 6, 1 and 4 say, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches. We're called to stretch ourselves out, all right. It's on the cross, 
and that cross is never going to be padded. It's rough and it's splintery. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Do you really want to get close to Jesus? And toss your mattress and take up your cross. The cross of self-denial. That's what the whole picture of the cross is. Jesus did not want to go to the cross, but he did not decide based on what he wanted to do, but what he needed to do in obedience to the Father. Uh, don't just listen to others preach either. It's, uh, it takes self-discipline to make an effort to open the Bible for yourself. Say no to your lazy flesh and say yes to the Holy Spirit. If you're reading and say, man, I don't understand this, then dig in with all the free study aids available on the internet and publishing houses today. You probably have more practical resources available to you now than I had access to in the whole Northwest College Library in my Bible school days 40 years ago. And if you still have questions, great. Find another believer to discuss it with. It energizes me, me when other people want to understand Scripture enough to talk it over with me or somebody else. It's invigorating for everybody involved, especially if you're not just approaching it for intellectual curiosity, but to, for life application. I just make a practical suggestion here. And by the way, uh, the thing of rewards uh, is very much just finding practical things to prepare, to prepare the way so that something can happen. And so I'm possibly going to be speaking on First Peter in my next sermon series. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but why don't you take the book of First Peter. Go to the internet if you have access. Uh, Google BibleProject.com. They've got dozens and scores of videos. There's one for every book of the Bible, pretty much, a short over, overview. Uh, find that video, seven or eight minutes, look at it. Then open your Bible and start reading. Look at the concordances. I suggest uh, Blue Letter Bible is one of my favorite sites, just simple and, and uh, very, very helpful. Uh, but uh, look at it for yourself, and then if you have more questions, talk to somebody else. You say, but I don't want to bother somebody else. I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to take up their time. Well, sometimes you have to apparently inconvenience other people in order to get closer to Jesus. Every person that woman touched uh, that day was made ceremonially unclean until evening. But they each got to see a miracle that day. They gain an insight into the heart of God that would never have happened if that woman hadn't touched them, if she hadn't pressed against them in the crowd and worked her way in through to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. They gain something along with her. People that help you, they gain something as well. Uh, you know, those people that day, they might soon forget the inconvenience of having been declared unclean the rest of that day, but they would never forget the miracle and the interaction that they witnessed between Jesus, the Messiah, and the woman that day. The woman who tossed her mattress into the dumpster because it was more important for her to get close to Jesus than to stay in her comfort zone. The point here is that you won't get close to Jesus by just doing what you feel like doing. A close relationship with God will not be found within our comfort zone. He calls us to himself, and where he is will be a place that threatens our flesh and our natural inclinations. Think of Peter, the wind is howling, the waves are raging, and Jesus says, come. He walks out on the water, he gets out of the boat, out of his comfort zone. Jesus called the other disciples, uh, they left their nets, they left the tax table, they left what was familiar with them and launched into the unknown. unknown. Uh, out of their comfort zones. When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, they had a familiar territory. They'd been there 400 years. They knew all the customs. They knew what was expected of them. And although it was bitter and they, uh, they were cruelly treated, still they wanted to go back later when they got out in the wilderness because it was out of their comfort zone of knowing what to expect. They had to trust God, but they had a chance to get 
acquainted with God out there in the wilderness, out of their comfort zone. His provision, his miracles, his, his care for them. And if we want to get to know Jesus better, it's going to take getting out of our comfort zones. This woman definitely got out of hers. Uh, you know, they weren't going to learn about God in the way in Egypt that they would out in the wilderness. Uh, but we are weak and wimpy by nature. Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, under such tremendous stress and praying his disciples three times, they fall asleep while he's asked them to, to wait with him there and to join with him. Matthew 26, 40, And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? says, Peter, toss your mattress uh, in the dumpster. If you want to join with me, uh, get up off your mattress and, and get on your, off your lazy bones, get on your prayer bones. Verse 41 says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's something in us that wants to respond. The spirit is willing, but there's a part of us that wants to resist and a part of us that's, that, that's just unable to, to function in the way that it should. And, and God is merciful to us, uh, but we need to do all that we can to, to step closer to him. And to, it's going to involve a challenge that's going to interfere with our selfish, lazy, fearful flesh, whatever arena that may be that God is, is speaking to us and we're struggling with it. Now you may hear this message. I think, well, that's good for all the people who are already spiritual uh, and they know how to pray and study. People that are the, quote, good Christians that just need a little kick in the pants to keep them going. But I'm a long way from where I should be. I'm more condemned than motivated when I hear this challenge. God's a rewarder, great, but I'm not much of a diligent seeker. I really never sought God or else it's been so long ago. If you feel like that, probably we all do sometimes. I want to share something I discovered this week. Thinking about diligently seeking God, I thought came to my mind. I've, I've seen uh, two places in Scripture that give this promise that if we're going to seek God diligently, it says we, we seek Him with all our heart, we will find Him. So I looked those two places up, and in both instances, I saw that they were written to people who had strayed far from God. In Deuteronomy, they were preparing to enter the promised land, but God knew their sinful tendencies and warned them against the danger of backsliding. Uh, Moses was giving them a warning. When they got into the land, he said, I know you're going to fall away, you're going to get distracted, you're going to worship the idols of these foreign heathen uh, peoples. Uh, and so, in Deuteronomy 4.26, Moses tells them this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. From there, from there, from where? From that place of following other, other idols, other things we think would make us happy and ending up leaving us empty. It says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart with all your soul, diligently seeking. He's a rewarder. But then the diligently seeking, sometimes have to, things have to get serious before we get serious. The next verse says, When you are in tribulation, and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. Maybe there's somebody hearing this today that says, that's me. Uh, God says, if you will, if you will, uh, search for me with all your heart, with all your soul, I, you will find me. When you're in tribulation, these things come upon you. You will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. 
He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. And then later in the book of Jeremiah, all these things had come to pass and God didn't forget. He didn't say, well, I warned him back there in the crossing of the Jordan in the book of Deuteronomy. And now they're exiled in Babylon because of their backsliding so badly that God allowed them to be taken captive by their enemies. And here as they are in the land of exile, Jeremiah 29, verse 10, one of the powerful verses of Scripture. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Believe it. Take it, receive it, and then do something to enable yourself to, to achieve, to lay hold of the reward that's promised here. It says in verse 12, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations in all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. There's a great verse in Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked man forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy unto our God for he will abundantly pardon. That is a promise that God is calling us to today. He's saying, lay down your mattress, uh, toss it in the dumpster and pick up your cross. Come after me, follow me. The reward is going to be so worth the risk. It's going to be so worth the effort. And so whether you've been following Jesus for 70 years, whether you today are just going to say, Jesus, I'm tired of doing my own thing, running my own way, seeking after everything else that doesn't satisfy and leaves me only with regrets. I, I'm going to choose today. I'm going to make a choice like that lady did. I'm going, to, I'm going to push through everything else. I'm going to touch the hem of your garment, and I'm going to be made well. So God help us to have courage instead of choosing comfort today. Amen.